training and watching me. But that's where YouTube comes in very helpfully. Is this yours, my love? No, it's yours. Just don't want to have it in the hill. I'll bit knock it over. Okay, so we're talking about how you memorise. Well, it's not, it's not strictly speaking accurate to talk about memorising right at the beginning, is it? What are we doing right at the very beginning? Rhythm. Yeah, exactly. Playing by ear. And I think that different children start learning things more, um, like memorising things, rather than just playing a tune that they know at different times. Surprise, surprise. Um, but when do you think you have to introduce some sort of intellectual memory tricks rather than just playing what you hear? Where would it be very unusual for a child to be playing entirely by ear by? <laughs> You'd be lucky if you get all the way to book three playing entirely by by listening, not thinking at all about different endings. Oh, right. That's a, that's an intellectual trick, isn't it? Thinking right, yeah. the first time it goes up, the second time it goes down. Yeah. Or even like you wrote, like yeah. on the way to Mexico and up the scale we go go go. Yeah. Are like mind tricks. It's not just playing what you hear. So for some children, it can be very early. Well, for some children, they'll even need it in twinkle. Um, but I think that most kids. Well, let's talk in book one. Just chuck out. Where do you get the different endings? Which pieces have got different endings? One more go. Good. Uh, no, no. Go to Mount Rosie. In the middle. Saturation. Yeah. Go to Mount Rosie. Yeah. comes after perpetual motion? Uh, Not quite. No. Nearly. <laughs> Nearly the same word. El Greto. Yeah. Does it have different endings? Are you clear what I mean by that? No. Okay. So El Greto is a very good case in point. Come on. <laughs> Exclusively, I guess I mean. So we've got those ways to help the kids remember what they're doing, like talking about endings. What else can help them to memorise a piece? Words. Structure. Structure. Excellent. So. help with memory. So we have words, can be very helpful. Structure. Hannah, can you just explain a little bit what you mean? Um, so we can, can call them anything but like A, E, P, A, bread, jam, jam, bread. Um, dividing the piece into um, repeated sections mm -hmm. and 
and what do lots of people, including my staff kit, use to show that visually? Excellent, yeah, the coloured lines. So you might um, have seen for example in Liga Bot that you have, you know, this is the green tune, but then because this is a different ending. And the, ending, the beginning is the same. Dun, dun, dee, 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 dee. Light green ending. Dun, 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 dun. Because it's like an A and a B ending, but it's much more uh, visually arresting for the children to see. Oh yeah, dark green, light green, but they're the same tune, so it's not a different part of. It's not a different color completely. Then new tune. Do, 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 do. Yeah, and then. For example, you have the wiggly line because that's going into the orange section for do 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 and then at the end you have the wiggly line because it's the same but then it becomes a dotted line because you just finish. So that's another ending. So actually in Lily Gobot we have that green tune with four different endings and we play it six times a lot. Yes. Does that make sense? Have you seen that with the colours underneath as well as... I remember, I don't need it. It's great. Um, so structure can be coloured lines, endings, two lines, can be A, B, A, or A1, A2, etc. Can also be like a sandwich, or layer cake. So, uh, Devon, can you name me any piece that you would say is a sandwich? Pringle. Very good. And uh, Joe, anything that would be a layer cake? A virtual motion. It's a handbag in there. It is also, yeah, it's a sandwich with two fillings, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Whereas a layer cake would mean it's just different stuff. Oh, well, where the beginning doesn't come back? Um, sorry, I've lost the plot on that. So can any of us think of a piece, like, so if we're thinking about letters, you would think it's A, B, C, D, rather than A, B, A, C, A, D, which is a kind of complicated sandwich, isn't it? Good box. Which one? Never brought a million. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, in book one, good book for Gossip. Gossip. What, uh, on the page, yes, but why isn't that correct? Because it's a repeat. Yeah, it's got a dark echo. Mm. There aren't very many, right? Yeah. Happy Farmer, almost. I mean, A, B, A, A1, A2. <laughs> yeah. What is it? A1, A1, A, uh, B, A2, B, A2. So. Yeah. But you know, basically, like this is one of the things you can talk to students about. Most pieces, you do get the original tune again because that's what makes them sort of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> in the bin. Uh, what makes them, you know, feel complete by the end, satisfying to play, um, all those kind of things. A Camille children is the closest we get, because we get that first tune twice in a row and then it doesn't come back. Uh, good, okay, so, um, anything else we can put on helping understand structure or memory? This is not a loaded Story. question. Yeah, stories. Uh, maybe we'll give that its own Stories and characterization. Who would like to tell us the story of Gavot and Do Minor? No? Okay, so Gavot and G Minor. Get my bonnet. No, I don't want to just get it. Um, a man had a pet goldfish, but he was very sad because it kept dying. Thank you. 
while thinking about that story because he's got to have another goldfish that dies again before he gets cross. And we can all recognise that this could sound cross. I'm not saying it has to, but it could. Whereas it just can't because it's a major scale. Mm. Yeah. So if you teach kids who are having trouble, or as adults if you're having trouble, remembering that piece, the order of it, then you will just have it. So stories and characterizations can be very helpful. Uh, what else can you do to help memorize? Let's say probably, how far do you think this will get you in terms of the repertoire for most kids? Obviously we're making generalizations, every child is different. But stories and stuff. What we've talked about already. How far do you think you would get if you didn't have any other tools in your toolbox to use? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, I guess we have said by ear, but that is because of daily listening. Yeah. yeah. If they're not doing that, they won't get anywhere by ear because obviously they won't know it. Yeah. Thank you for making me clarify that. So, using listening, if they are listening every day, mm. most days, uh, if you have given them words for bits that are really tricky. If you are explaining regularly the structure of the piece, talking about you know whether it repeats or whether it just layers up. If you're using stories and characterizations, how far do you think on average that will get you? And I'm talking to people who have students and have had for a while, so I guess Joe um, and uh, So usually there are three things that don't happen. Two things I can think of right now, but there was one. Uh, four fingers, where, where and shifting, mm -hmm. that shifting is the first where the fingers that are optional, yeah, and what, what to use, and then um, bowing, yeah, excellent. And why are those three things not helped by what's on the board? Because you can't hear them repeated, exactly. Yeah, you can't, you have to have a very sophisticated ear to hear the difference between an open E and a four, especially if it's a short note. You can't hear the bowing, I mean, you can hear some bowing. But there's definitely not a person on the planet who could say, I can tell you exactly what bow is being used by listening to a recording, because that's not how a bow works. Uh, and shifting, again, you might be able to hear when there is a very clear shift, but you know, you have to have very sophisticated ears to hear whether you're hearing an E string sound or an A string sound or a D string sound with the same pitch. Um, so let's just make a little list here of problems and then we'll talk about solutions to those later on. First, I, I, I suppose it also doesn't help if you're uh, changing things in your view, like adding shifting or coming up with a new technique. Yeah. Oh, it's more easy for them to just sort of slot back into what they did before. Yeah. Um, I've remembered another thing, dynamic. Yes. So why are our children mostly quite bad at doing dynamics? Partly because the recordings. The recordings are all a bit so forte. Uh, Hilary Hahn's better. Um, Augustus Hadlick is better. But it's not, um, it's not ex e emphasised in a way that makes it easy for them to hear. Definitely. Um, okay, so what can, um, so to come back to my question from a while ago, where, how far do you think for the average child this will get you? Not worrying about these things, just thinking about can they play the piece accurately, start to finish without looking at the book. But they don't like the music yet as well. Well, we haven't identified what level we're talking about, so good point, but it depends what the answer to the question is. Yeah. I, I get them to listen to books before. Yeah. Before I push, but. Yeah, I think yeah. most kids, my, what, for my lovely level twos, what are the classic memory? Nightmare pieces. A tooth. Yep. Yeah. What else in book one do you think it would be difficult? Is difficult to memorise. Gothic. Gothic. Very good. Uh, run me through all of the pieces in 
book one. Kit, be the first two, please. Ugh, uh, slightly worried. Someone who's being good. Hotel. Yeah. through the order of the piece, the better you will um, put together the teaching points for that piece, how the piece starts at least, even if you don't run through all of it in your head, and how the pe how the children learn, you know, like what the order of the pieces that they learn in, and that really helps for you to pick out the pieces that you need later on. So like when you're doing level two, if you get to the end of book two and your children are rubbish at up a staccato, for example, uh, you need to know immediately, like these are the pieces that I can pull out to do in a review kind of set. Whereas when you're teaching book one, you're mostly still just teaching the pieces and doing review kind of randomly, maybe long bows, short bows. But, um, you know, as you go through the repertoire, that's what you need to have is those like sets of pieces that help you with specific things. So the more that we just make sure we know the order of the pieces and which piece is which, and I'm hoping, as you say, the names you will hear a little bit of it in your head, uh, that's what will really help. So book two. Book two, choose my famous, Musette, Hunter's Chorus. Good. Two more, please. By uh, Laura Rigaud Waltz. Good. What's Laura Rigaud? <laughs> is that how far I can Long, long ago, Waltz. Long, long ago, Waltz. Thank you. Uh, Devin, do you know what comes after Long, long ago, Waltz? You're looking at that. Um, Go on then, <laughs> give us a few. Uh, Dure, two ideas. only because there's that section towards the end of the beginning where children tend to put in up bows when they shouldn't. And it yeah, I don't mean on that kind of level. I mean, like, oh, really, I can't general. play it from beginning to end, da, da, even da, da, with some mistakes. Da, 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 da. Yes. Yeah, mignon, yeah, yeah, mignon definitely. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So, can let's all open mignon I need my towards the end of book two. No, it's the middle of the book. Is it? Page -wise. Oh, page-wise, yeah. yes. It's a piece of course. Um, have you got your book too? Yeah. No. There is, there is mine. Oh, okay. Is this the next page? No, the last page. The page before. Oh. There we go. So, if you have a look at Mignon. We have the opening tune.
major, difficult bit to remember and put together for the kids in any of the pieces so far. Right, but there you've got the orange section with the Ritter Bando, and then we get the blue section for me anyway, this tune again. And it doesn't have the first ending. So it goes straight to, so bar 34 goes straight to the second ending of the first opening tune. Yeah? Then we have the whole B flat major bit. so that your body kind of knows what to do. That helps very much with um, things like, for example, if we're thinking about the Aldi G minor, Place and go to a different place. What can you use 
We're going to talk more about yeah the structure, and you might be using things, for example, like um, when you uh, so the first ending you stay low, the second ending you go high, the third ending you know like if, in fact if we take it back to book four, the third movement of the Vivaldi A minor, first time long high. Right, advanced memory. Um, techniques, I guess they are. Actually, playing with a video can work at any level. Um, it's basically like being in group class, right? Loads of kids will play the right notes in group class and not by themselves because they've got someone to watch and we give cues about what's going to happen. So playing, um, so what do you think would be easier, playing with a video or playing with an audio recording? Audio. Easier for memory? Mm. Why do you think it would be easier than playing with a video? I mean with a video that's got the audio on as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So playing with a video, with sound, So you might even set your twinklers that to do when they're trying to just put together all those bits of twinkle. Um, Would this be a video of you playing? Could I, be. Ideally, if we have an internet is right, that people see the same place as possible. Yeah, it would be good yeah. to know that it is a decent one. But also, if you're talking about twinkler, I mean... They, they, from the feedback I've got, they have, students have said they, they'd much rather play with you because they know you. Yeah. yeah, I think a lot of students want to play with their teacher, even if their teacher is not as good as other people who are on the internet. And like I said, with twinkles, it doesn't matter. But arguably, it doesn't matter for years. Um, you know, even that dodgy, he's not dodgy. He's the not guy with the cat on his t-shirt that's not a very good player, still much more useful than them just playing the wrong thing every day and then they come into their lesson and think they've got it right and they've practiced it so hard and so long completely incorrectly. And then you've got lots of work to do unpicking. You know, the damage that might be done by watching him play and hearing him play less than wonderful tone is nothing compared with having to spend weeks on doing something that you've learned incorrectly. Mm -hmm. um, but you then have to convince the child that it's incorrect because often they, they won't want to change it because no, I did it, this is, I'm correct. And it's like, no, no, actually, let's go back to the recordings and see if it matters. Yeah, well, I was time. just going to say, yeah. so how would you convince them? I yeah. <laughs> just this. say, okay, let's listen to the recording no, right I now and this. you've got I'm no... I always have to paint a blows with this child, but um, <laughs> help me really. But um, I, I said, okay, right, we'll do this. Let's video you playing it and make sure you're very happy with it. And he did. I said, okay, now let's listen to the recording and see if it, if it matches. And he, he went, hmm, I might have to look at some parts of that again. I said, yeah, would you like me to help you with that? Yeah, great, perfect. Right. That's yeah. excellent teaching. That's exactly what you need to do. Because, you know, when you're in that situation, to digress slightly, it's very easy if you've got a child who's being belligerent, basically, like, no, I am right, to kind of be like, no, you will you will respect me because I'm the teacher and you must recognise that you're wrong and I'm right just because I say so. Whereas, actually, that's just going to become battle of wills, isn't it? And, like, being like, how can I help you? Okay, why don't we watch you? Why don't we watch someone on the internet or listen to the recording? 
and, and then to let them realise in their own way that they've got it wrong is much more helpful than just kind of pulling the, like, um, authority card. Authority card, thank you. Mm. Perfect. Okay, so playing with a video with sound, uh, what do you think would come next in terms of difficulty playing with audio only or with video only, with no sound? Audio only. Yes, I think so. So, playing with a video without sound? No, oh, I would say the other way around, sound first. Oh, that the audio would be easier no, to follow. So the kids are quite visually centred though, aren't they? I think it's very close. I, don't, I think it would be down to the individual child, actually. I don't think you can say one is easier than the other. Um, sorry, I misunderstood you. Uh, playing with audio only. So these kids be sort of like that. <laughs> don't even know what that's supposed to be. Never mind. Um, and then what else? What else can we offer them? Think about visual learning. Yeah, there's a colour section for the book. Uh, if that's not enough to help. Um, could you borrow some bits of music from Dan and Ollie? No, no, they definitely would. Yeah. I mean, if your kids can't follow the notes they're listening to and put their finger in the right place in the music by kind of pretty early book one, middle of book one, then you haven't done enough music reading with them. Not that they would be able to read that music correctly first time, but they can definitely understand what's happening on the page enough to follow it. And singing it? Good. It. Yeah, let's put that over here with... Um, Yeah, because sometimes a memory slip is about what's happening physically is too difficult to remember as well. So you can check which it is, if it's memory or difficulty, by getting them to sing it. I've had some students that we do a singing credit for every piece, and then I know that they've got it inside before they're trying to work it out. Um, okay, so the, um, now I'm thinking more of probably book four, level i think what we've got on the board will help most people with most problems apart from those which we're going to talk about uh, until book four but once you get to something like sites one are you talking about which aspects of the memory like general structure or just, just being able detail? to play the piece right not necessarily with every single fourth finger or open string or bowing right but not not running out of notes or playing the B section before it should come or whatever. Do you know what I mean? The middle? Give them like a sore joint to do that kind of. Very good. So for example <laughs> Listen to it lots of times, 
and just kind of it not being so confusing. You know, it's not, it's difficult to, it, it's easy to feel like a piece is difficult to memorise, but actually it's not the whole piece that's difficult to memorise. It's those moments where you need a signpost in your mind for where you're going. So you need to find things like, first top C goes to A4. Second top C goes to E3. So by muscle memory we just mean being able to do something without really thinking about it because you've done it so many times. Hopefully right. Hopefully correct, yeah, obviously. Mm -hmm. If you practice it many times incorrectly, you'll be really good at doing it wrong. And it won't make it any easier to do it right. And then the last thing that I want to talk about for this is look, look away, is what I call it. And this is not going to fit on my lovely white board. Um, can you take a picture of this, somebody, and put it on the, I'm just going to make my memorize yeah, it, but so. I don't think it will come out in the photo. Put it on the WhatsApp. So this is classic case in point, how we use the WhatsApp group is by one person taking a picture of this and then putting it on the WhatsApp group so we can all see it any time, rather than each of you making notes. And I mean, I do also want you to make notes, but, um, you know, just having random pictures in your um, library. Thank you, Joe. So look, look away. Now I'm going to keep those. Look, look away is a kind of pyramid scheme of chopping up complicated music into playable short bursts. And you want it to be an amount of music that you're going to be able to play, if you read it once, then you're going to be able to remember it at least once correctly. So in some cases that might be a very short amount of time of music. Um, Hannah, what piece would you like me to use as an example from book four or five? Um, Mummy for the Babies. Uh, okay, she's a quite a Barbara G minor first movement. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, So, 
This okay. is the book for A minor. So for example, most students, I think, will probably, once they've been playing it for a while, be able to play from the beginning quite easily up to the end of bar 12. So look, look away would be like this, that we look. It's not generally that bit that's the problem, it's this bit. And then they would try it off by heart, and then they would look again. And so this is the thing that's really important about this, is what often happens when they start to use these new skills around memorising, is that as soon as you can play it off by heart, you play it off by heart, and then you don't realise if you've made a mistake. So that's when you can end up with a child who's practiced something really hard, but there's just some little thing has snuck in there, a natural or a flat or whatever. So look, look away. is like this, with the music, without the music. Once, times one, times one, times one, times two, times one, times three, times one, times four, times one, times five. So if you're really good at maths, you'll work out that that's however many repetitions they've done. Um, <laughs> 20 repetitions they've done now, and five of them have been with the music. And Ten of them have been without. And so that's a really good way for them, as long as their music reading is good enough, to check that they're doing the right thing, but to gradually work off the page. And you know, most of my students, if they use this method, they will learn that box within a few days, like not even a whole week. So they may have three or four boxes that they're doing look, look away. And by book five, certainly, and for quite a lot of students by book four, I'm dividing each piece up into chunks for a credit, and then they put them all together at the end, because otherwise you can just end up with the kids yeah. suddenly feeling like they spent a whole term on one piece, and then they're only gonna learn three pieces a year. But actually, you know, size one is like three pieces from book three, certainly three book two pieces equivalent. So we do, you know, one page at a time or one section at a time for a credit. Um, so this, I think, is the thing that, like, I've, I've, you know, I was a Suzuki kid, I play by ear uh, pretty well, and sight read very well, and I have quite a visual memory as well, and so between that, and that's the other thing we haven't talked about, like the visual, visualising the page, um, but, you know, the first time I really struggled with memorising something was when I did the um, Shostakovich Violin Concerto, and it's so mad and weird. <laughs> I literally had to learn one phrase at a time, and this is how I did it. Um, so it's really, really good for that. So would you do that again with more um, bigger phrases? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but I mean, you probably don't need to, because most of the music that we play, Shostakovich is not included, <laughs> but certainly most of the music we play in Suzuki has all of these large swathes in the middle where they just know how it goes. You know, if you ask a child who says, I haven't memorised Bach Double yet, to start at the beginning and play, they'll get a long way before they actually run out of music because they haven't realised that what, the, what it is is those little bits that need this treatment. And like the tune bit, you know, you just know what's happening. Um, so that can also be really reassuring for them to hear. Like, it's not that you don't know the piece yet, it's that you don't know the signposts, and they will hang the whole piece together for you once you've learnt four bits. 
I think I've been accidentally doing that approach. Great. Um, <laughs> I have a copyright <laughs> still. <laughs> but when I've been looking at book five, um, especially when I had some time, mm -hmm. um, and I was just, in my practice book, I was just writing like literally a bar or a bar and a half, or, or even a transition where you've got, I have to remember a shift or something. Yeah. And then doing that, but not doing it consecutively, like literally just, I'd decide which ones to do and then yeah. leave it. Yeah. And then go to the next piece. So it yeah. wasn't even like a whole section, it was just like odd bars. Yeah. And I was filling in the gaps. And yeah. It helped my memory be more stronger, I think, because you're yeah, definitely. more familiar with going definitely. through. Definitely, yeah. So another way of starting at the end and then backwards. Yeah, yeah. So going backwards is really helpful as well. Um, so visualising the page, literally some children will find it much easier to remember, for example, going to third position at the end of page one, because they won't be able to read the music in their mind, so to speak, but they will have a sense of where they are in each page. And if you sort of tell them like this, the end, you know, rather than like the third ending goes into third position, which means that they have to have the kind of mind that will track I'm on the first ending, I'm on the second ending, I'm on the third ending. At the end of page one, remember to go up into third position. For lots of kids, that will just like, oh yeah, done it, I remember. Uh, just like, you know, the more sophisticated version of Minuet 3, go down and go up. Um, so I think visualising the page can really help. I think um, noticing like the first time something happens. So to go to Vivaldi and minor third movement, what often happens if you have book four, can you look at the end of page 19? What often happens is that um, Always does. 
starting at the beginning because anything that's hard you'll find with most kids the first bit's really good the middle bit's less good and the end gets neglected so practicing backwards so to speak is just also a good way to kind of reverse that trend especially if there's like a climax yeah mm -hmm. and is your memory getting more stronger as you go through the piece from the beginning and the two things together yeah it's more familiar and physically more familiar yeah, so visualising the page, practising backwards. Is there anything else I haven't written down? Yeah. Cool. There we go. Any questions about memorising? Which bit was that with which group that you just played? That, that was with Aldi and Manifold. Yeah, that's a good one. Last time we won to... 75, actually. Well, 75, yeah. yeah. To 19, what? First beat of 19. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, one question, sorry. Yes? With all of this, what we're getting into our heads is like more taking us away from the music. It's a lot of, a lot of it. Yeah. Um, how do you then get back, or like, yeah, how do you make sure then your kid is not like, okay. Just becoming a robot about, yeah. yeah. And actually playing music to. I think, that's a really great feeling. question, thank you. I think for my students, book four is really important for them to learn off by heart, certainly up to bath double. Um, I think that they need to practice this kind of intellectual understanding of music and then they need to get, would you mind Kit, thank you, um, tell, and I'll be free in about three minutes, um, please, uh, they need to practice the intellectual side of it and then they need to practice putting it together as a performance. So I think it's a kind of layering, if you think about like your first job when you approach a piece and I talk a lot with my students about it being like building a house. We've got to lay the foundation, so that's listening to it lots of times so we know how it goes. We've got to build the walls, put in the windows, decide where the doors are going to go. That's learning the notes, the bowings, the shifting, the rhythms, like the, you know, the bare bones of the piece. It's not going to sound like a piece of music, mostly, but it's like a, it's like a, you know, it's like a box of flats we see being built. You can see where the doors are, where the bathroom's going to go, but it's not finished yet. And then the memory is part of that, isn't it, if you're requiring it to be off by heart. So then once you've got all of those, you know, you've built your foundation, you've laid your foundations, you've built your house, then the really fun bit is like, oh, what colour shall I paint this wall? And what picture am I going to put on the wall? And where would I like the, you know, what kind of bathroom am I going to have? And that's your dynamics, your phrasing, how you move, how you breathe, how you relate to another player if you're playing it or someone else. And that's the kind of, like, icing on the cake. And that's the reason why... Here, anyway, we require all solos to be at least three pieces back. By the time they get into book four, they're sometimes one piece back because I consider each piece yeah. to be like three pieces. You don't want to put them back two years, you know. Um, but that it's got to be a piece they're really familiar with so that they can think about all of those things. And their memory is like just not a problem anymore. There might be a moment where they still have to remember, oh, it goes down here, not up. Yeah. But it doesn't stop them playing all of the piece beautifully. What, I suppose so just, uh, just, uh, <laughs> go, 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 I'll come um, back to this. With the colours, you said that, I just want to get like an overview. Dynamics, what other things, like articulations and stuff? Would that yeah, articulation, like? phrasing, dynamics, um, tempo changes, mm. uh, vibrato, breathing, how you play with other people if you are not playing unaccompanied, if you are playing unaccompanied, what extra things you need to bring for your audience because it's unaccompanied. Um, bow speed. I could think that'll probably do. It's yeah. <laughs> a short list, not exhaustive. Um, bow speed. And a lot of this is still quite technical. Yeah. But, but you need to know how to make the techniques. Uh, hang on a... Is it the right size? Okay, thanks, bye. Um, you've got to 
that's the beauty of music, isn't it? Is that you have to do these really technical things to a point where you can do them to make the music sound amazing without thinking, now I'm going to speed my bow up. But you know that that's what you have to, if you're going to do it, if you're going to do it, you can't do a crescendo by feeling it. You have to do it with your body. So it's got to be a technical thing that you make happen. But then you get to the point where you do it instinctively or you've done it so many times you don't need to think about how you're doing it and you can just be guided by the sound. Mm. But that doesn't mean that it's not based in the technique because no matter how much we feel we might want a beautiful sound, you actually can't feel your way into beautiful sound. You do have to make your arm do the right things to make it happen. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So I think it's about making it so consolidated that it feels instinctive. Say in that the signposting and talking about fingers and stuff, you can also use the accompanying part for that as well. Yeah, absolutely. So you could say, you know, you could link this and here so that you hear the second and piano part, or you're not as important as the piano parts. So that would go into dynamics and stuff as well, because it's like, no, it's not about you at this point, you've got to listen to what the piano is doing, and you've got to match with what they're doing. So that is a bit more along what you were saying about the musicianship of it, mm-hmm. because you tying it into the memorizing, and when they listen to the accompaniment, and when they're playing with a person, means they're gonna be waiting for it, they're gonna be listening for it. So when you start talking later on about harmony and stuff, and about whatever theory you wanna bring to the lesson, that they've got something in their experience they can put down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very good point, thank you. Um, I think also, the thing about the signposts, the beauty of the signpost is that it makes you realize how much of the piece you do know without thinking about so you can think about all those other things and it's just the moment that you need to remember something like going to third position whereas if you haven't identified that you can just play the whole piece thinking I don't know how this piece goes even though you do know how loads of it goes because you haven't worked out where the signpost is so you feel anxious about it yeah. I remember the other thing that's really helpful is thinking through your piece So if you have a piece you're trying to learn off by heart, you may not know until you play it whether you do know it off by heart or not. But the way to do that if you can't sleep or if you're on the bus and you don't have your violin with you is to think, okay, well, when I start, dun, 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 well, how far do I get before I think, ah, I don't know what comes next. And then when you go to your music and your violin next time, that's where you need to look and work at. Um, and, you know, like, certainly for me, one of the things that happens if, if when I'm trying to memorise a piece it goes round and round and round because I can't get out of the loop of where I don't know what to do. And I have been known to get up in the middle of the night and just be like, right, what happens there? Because it just it will just play on a loop until I know how to finish the loop by getting to the end. Mm-hmm. And I know that some of my students have had the same kind of feeling. You can do the air on the bus. It makes you look a bit weird. Yeah, I doubt that you'll get many teenagers who are happy to uh, yeah. engage with that kind of behaviour. But you go for it if you think that you can get them to no, do it. But if, for example, they're in a household where there's a lot of other kids and yeah. mum or dad finds it difficult to practice with them, it's yeah. like shove them in a corner with a book and say, right, air bow it. Yeah. Because if you can air bow it and walk down the street, say. <laughs> but also you don't even have to literally air bow it. You will know. If you're sat on the bus, you'll. You can, you can feel whether you know if it's an up bow or a down bow without actually moving your arm, can't you? It's the same thing as being able to sing it in your head. <laughs> I bet you can. Right, please, will you put that on the chat as well? Um, we are going to have a quick break, comfort break, and then play the Vivaldi G minor. Yay. Yay! <laughs>